Escape the endless scroll with the One Islam TV app, your halal entertainment solution on all platforms. One God, one message, one purpose of life. Subscribe now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Uh, last Wednesday, I had begun discussing the signs of Judgment Day. We had divided them into uh, a number of categories. We talked about the minor signs and the major signs. And then I said the minor signs as well can be divided into two types of categories. Number one, specific incidents, one-off. And number two, general trends. So we were doing still the specific incidents. And today, inshallah, we'll continue with the specific incidents. I had mentioned the battle of the Jamal, the battle of Safin. I had mentioned the spread of uh, safety in the time of the Sahaba. And now we move on to the next of the minor signs that have been predicted in the authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the minor signs, and this clearly shows the truth of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because no one could ever have predicted this, is the rise of a race that was considered to be a backward race. And this is the race of the Atraq, the Turks, the Atraq. Our Prophet ﷺ prophesied that this race would become dominant and that they would conquer the Arabs. Now, who are the Atraq? The Atraq are a group of races. It's not just one race. Within the Turk, there are many races. It's like saying Arab. There are many Arab sub-races. It's one of the categories of human races. The Atraq are a group of races who originate in what is essentially Mongolia and the Caucasus Mountains, that region. You can say they are the cousins of the Mongolians. So the Mongolians are a race and the Atraq are a cousin race. They have a common ancestor between them. And that is why the Turkish language and the Mongolian language, they share many similarities. Now, contrary to popular misunderstanding, the modern Atraq, the people of Turkey, are not from that land of Turkey. They are from far more east than that. They are from a land that is what is now, we call it Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan were the Xinjiang provinces. Okay, That is the land of the Atraq. And the Atraq came from there and they eventually conquered what is now modern Turkey. And it was called Turkey because the Atraq came there. Before they came there, it wasn't called Turkey. That's not the name of that land. It was called Anadolia or other lands of that nature. Uh, the name Turkey, the country Turkey, is after the race, the Atraq, that eventually conquered that region. Originally, the Atraq were a far away from the Arabs. And the Arabs never interacted with them by and large. The Arabs hardly interacted with any race other than the Sassanids and the Byzantine Empire. For our Prophet Sallallahu in Medina, to predict that that far away race is going to rise up and eventually dominate. What is the Ottoman Empire other than Turkish, right? This is one of those miraculous predictions. And by the way, these ahadith were compiled centuries before the rise of the Ottoman Empire. You will find manuscripts, those who deny the authenticity of hadith, you will find manuscripts written in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century predicting the rise of the Atraq and the Turks rose up 500 years ago, that's it. And there are many, many ahadith, the most famous amongst them, and the, these are also in Sahih Muslim, some of them. And there's a genre of hadith. The most famous amongst them, the Prophet ﷺ used alliteration. Alliteration means he said things that sound the same and they have a level of eloquence. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Leave the Turks as long as they leave you. Don't fight the Turks. Leave the Turk as long as they tarakukum, they leave you alone. Because when you will fight them, you will lose. And they will win over you. And that is exactly what happened. Now, some have said this could also be a prediction of the Mongol Empire. Because the, Mongol, the Mongolian race and the Turk are really kind of one race, as we said. They go back to the same heritage and even their language. And so a thousand years ago, it would not be incorrect to call the Mongols, the Genghis Khan, it would not be incorrect to call him an, a Turk. 
even though in modern times there are two separate ethnicities, the Mongolian and the, and the uh, Turkic races. However, others have said the prediction of Turk here is the Muslim Turks eventually, right? So eventually, this group of people, they came, amongst them were the Seljuks. So within the Turkish race, there were many famous dynasties. The most famous of the earliest dynasties was the Seljuk dynasty, Al-Parsalan. Al-Parsalan was the one who came to power and he was the first of the Turkish people to basically get a base in the lands of Islam and they converted to Islam and of course his main vizier was Nizam al-Mulk, the famous Nizam al-Mulk. So that was Al-Parsalan. The Seljuk Empire is not the same as the Ottoman Empire. They are both Turkic but the two of them biologically are different. So the first Turkish empire was the Seljuk empire. They were magnificent. They came, they conquered, and then they fizzled out. And then another group came, the Osmanlis. We call them the Ottomans, right? Those of you that are watching the Ertuğrul series, which is a mythic, uh, you know, romanticization of that. But it is, you know, the kernel of history is there. So the rise of the Usman tribe, Usmanli. Ottoman is the children of Usman. This is the second prediction. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted that this empire and this group would become the dominant one. And that is exactly what happened. That when the Turks came, they eventually took over the Muslim land. And in the early part of the 16th century, 15, 15 or so, they requested from the final remnants of the Abbasid Empire to hand over the Khilafah to them. And so they then acquired the Khilafah. And from around 1500 CE up until 1927, as you know, the uh, Ottoman Empire was the caliphate of Muslim lands. And it was the only empire that claimed to be the Khalifa that were non-Arab. Before this point, the Seljuks never claimed to be Khalifa. The Seljuks were a rural dynasty. They never said they were the Khalifa. The Seljuks were in power when the Abbasids were the Khalifa. And they were a powerful dynasty, but they never said they were the Khalifa. And the Ottomans were the first non-Arab to say that they were the Khalifa of Islam. Another prediction also related to the Ottoman Empire is just as bizarre. And that is the conquest of the single greatest city in the history of the medieval world. A city that we would think of it like the New York or something of our times. And that is Constantinople. Once again, what is Constantinople? Constantinople for a thousand years was the bastion of Western civilization. And what will make us understand what Constantinople was? We hardly study history, we have no idea what Constantinople was. Constantinople, for over a thousand years, it was the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantine himself, Constantinople is named after him. Constantine the Great established the capital, the city existed even before then. And for a thousand three hundred years, it remained the capital of the greatest empire known to man up until that point in time. And that was the great Roman Empire. And Europe was nothing at the time. Europe was a backward land. Europe was barbarians at the time. Even Christianity has not spread in Europe when Constantinople was the center of Christendom and of the Holy Roman Empire. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that the Muslims would one day conquer Constantinople. Again, an amazing prediction. How can a small group of persecuted people in Mecca dream, daydream of conquering Constantinople? But our Prophet ﷺ predicted that. Now, because of this, the Sahaba had it in their minds that they wanted to conquer Constantinople. And in fact, the first Sahabi to launch a campaign to try to conquer Constantinople was none other than Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. When he was barely in his early 20s, he managed to come very close to Constantinople via the Navy fleet. As you know, they landed in Cyprus and then they landed on the banks of the Bosphorus and then they attempted to conquer the city, but it was way too powerful. They, see, they laid siege, but they could not. It was simply too powerful for them. And that is why the famous companion Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he died outside of the walls of Constantinople. The famous companion, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he lived 
Ra'at in his house when he entered Medina. Can you imagine the same companion whom the Prophet ﷺ lived in his house for six months? How Allah Azza wa blessed the Ummah. How quickly did the persecuted rise up and become almost the conquerors of the world? That same companion, older on in life, he was of that batch who uh, attacked Constantinople and he passed away a shaheed. He died outside the city and he was buried in an anonymous graveyard until it was miraculously discovered when uh, Suleiman al-Fatih uh, opened it. The fact of the matter, you want my academic opinion, this is not the actual grave of, of Abu Yub al-Ansari, the one that they claim to be. It is simply, a, anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, I don't sugarcoat the reality. This is just uh, something that uh, the Ottomans did to shore up uh, PR, to make people like me yani, feel yani, that they have something. But in reality, nobody knows where Abu Yub is buried. Who's gonna have marked the grave? How would they have known for a thousand years? Anyway, that's besides the point. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari's grave is somewhere. All I'm saying is the grave that they say that it is, it is actually, look it up historically, it is simply uh, constructed later on in history. The point being that the Sahaba attempted to conquer Constantinople and their eyes were on the prize. Many ulama and historians have said that Tariq ibn Ziyad, actually his main intention for going to Andalus was to make his way by land because he knew that by sea would not be possible because reinforcements, etc. He wanted to conquer land by land until he goes from North Africa to Andalus all the way to Constantinople. Some have presumed this and Allah knows best. The point is the eyes were on the prize. Many people wanted to conquer Constantinople, but of course it only happened in the year. Who knows what year Constantinople was conquered? What year? 14? 1453. Bye. Muhammad or Muhammad al-Fatih by Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, the Turks say uh, al-Fatih Muhammad. Uh, and the conquest of Constantinople changed the course of human history. It marked the end of one era and the beginning of another. Literally one of, you know, if you wanted to list the 10 most famous incidents in all of human history, the conquest of Constantinople is in the top five. It's that big of a deal that the Muslims finally conquered Constantinople. And this was predicted by our Prophet ﷺ. Hadith is a Sahih Muslim. That uh, a Sahabi asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, one of the Tabi'un asked him that which one will we conquer first? Constantinople or Rome? They had heard of Rome. Rome was there. But Rome was not to the power and the level of Constantinople. It was far number two. And so he said, bring me my book. So they opened up his book because uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aus, he would write a hadith of the Prophet and his eyes were failing. He looked it up and he wanted to refresh his memory. And he said, no, the Prophet predicted that we would conquer Constantinople before Rome. And subhanAllah, Constantinople 1453. And, and in all likelihood, the other lands that are mentioned will be done during the time of the Mahdi. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Now, there is a cryptic prediction about Constantinople that kind of sort of throws a spanner in the works. It kind of is difficult to understand. And I'll mention it to you and let's see if we can get some understanding and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talked about the Mahdi on last Saturday, I had mentioned that some ahadith seem to mention that the Mahdi will conquer Jerusalem and also Constantinople. Okay, and that is somewhat problematic because Constantinople has already been conquered and the Mahdi wasn't there. And the explicit authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim tells us the mechanism via which Constantinople will be conquered. And that is that the Muslims will lay siege for a long time and they will fall short of supplies and the, the, the himma will be going down until finally they will say, let us do dhikr of Allah loudly and we will conquer Constantinople via dhikr. And so they will begin chanting the tasbih and takbir and tahmeed and eventually the walls of the city will begin to shake and the walls will collapse because of the dhikr of the Muslims. Now that did not happen in 1453. In 1453, it was an all-out siege. Muhammad al-Fatih, he threw in the troops, the navy, the army. You know, he threw in everything. He laid siege for a number of times. Even the Ottomans tried multiple times. And by the way, one of the reasons the Ottomans could then demand from the Abbasids hand over the Khilafah, the Abbasids had gone down weak because of the Mongol invasion. They had to flee to the Mamluk Egypt. And the Ottomans 
after they conquered Constantinople, they then felt confident enough to say, okay, you guys, you're no longer qualified to be the Khalifa. We can be the Khalifa. So there was a ceremony in which the last of the Abbasids symbolically handed his cloak and his turban to the first of the Ottoman uh, Khalifas. That actually took place, an actual ceremony. When did it take place? After the conquest of Constantinople. Even though the Turks go back to 1300, the Ottomans go back to 1300, but they didn't feel confident enough to say to the Khalifa, make us the Khalifa, until they had the prize, until they had the silver platter with the city on it, and that is Constantinople. And of course, as you all know, they changed the name to Istanbul. And that is why if you go to Istanbul, and inshallah, I'll be doing that next year as well. If you want to come with the academic tour, there's so much history to see. So much history to see. You can see Christian history. You can see uh, Roman history. You can see Muslim history. You can see so much in that city. It goes back so many years and the eras of uh, you know, human civilization overlap. So how do we understand that hadith? In another hadith, we learn that Constantinople will be conquered by 70,000 children of Ishaq. Ishaq, the children of Isaac, will help conquer Constantinople. How do we understand this? Allah knows best. But it appears this is talking about another conquest towards the end of times. It appears that a time will come where that land will no longer be considered a part of the lands of Islam. That's not the case right now. But something might happen that those lands are no longer considered the lands of Islam. And so once again, there will have to be a reconquest. And so this hadith that talks about 70,000 of the children of Ishaq, who are the children of Ishaq? The Arabs would call the Romans children of Ishaq. And this hadith predicts that there will be many Western people, because Rome is the Western land, who will convert to Islam and who will be on the side of the Mahdi and who will be fighting on the side of the truth. And they will then be reconquering Constantinople from whoever else it is. And at that point in time, they will use the dhikr of Allah as a weapon. And the dhikr of Allah, there will not be violence, there will not be bloodshed. They will simply say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the dhikr will go louder and louder until as a miracle from Allah, the walls of the city will collapse and they will simply walk in and conquer the city without any bloodshed. This is something that didn't happen in 1453. So clearly, therefore, there will be another other conquering of uh, Constantinople towards the end of times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best another uh, prediction and this could be a trend and it could be a specific incident Allah knows best but we are all aware of one of the most amazing predictions that we now see in front of us in our own lifetime and that is the prediction that in the Arabian Peninsula there shall be higher and higher buildings in the Arabian Peninsula, there shall be skyscrapers. And this is something that, again, who could have ever imagined? We need to understand, when Islam came to Arabia, the Arabian people were of the most backward in the world. They did not even have government. They were tribal. You know, the basic sign of civilization is government. They didn't have a government. They didn't have a codified language. They did not have a script. The script was developed after Islam. They, there was not a single library in all of Arabia. There was no three-story structure. Didn't exist. The max you could do two stories, very small. They couldn't build tall buildings. That's why even when they had any type of technology, they're bringing it from outside because they're not any technological advance. They would import their swords from India. That's why the hadith mentions Indian swords. They would import their armor from Byzantine. They would import their cloth from Yemen. The Arabs did not have that level of civilization that, Arabs, uh, that other lands had. So for the Prophet ﷺ predict, to predict that Arabia and the Arab lands would have the tallest buildings is once again surreal. How could that happen? And not just that, but people who were only yesterday dirt poor would be competing with one another to who is going to build a taller building. And I don't need to go into explicit detail. Wallahi, this is self-evident as we speak. These oil-rich families that control that part of the world their own rulers were born in poverty. Listen to the interviews of the senior princes, those that are still alive. 
They tell us, look at their YouTube videos. When their own fathers came to power, and back in the 20s and 30s, they weren't rich. There wasn't oil back then. These same princes mentioned they didn't have running water. They didn't have shoes and slippers. They would run around in the sand. And what did our Prophet ﷺ say? You will find barefoot shepherds. Their ancestors were shepherds. They were barefoot. And now that they are the multi-billionaires, what do they do? What is their pastime? What is their hobby? In the year 2000, Faisaliya Center opens up. In 2010, Burj Khalifa opens up. In 2015, this happens. Each one of these princes wants to show that I have the bigger building. And Burj Khalifa, by the way, is two and a half times taller than the Empire State Building. Go imagine that. And when the other prince of Arabia heard that, he goes, Khalas, I'm going to build in Riyadh something that is even taller than your Burj Khalifa. It's as if, mashallah, their iman is so strong, they want to prove the process and correct. And they're going to say, look, I'm going to do exactly what the Prophet said. But of course, they, anyway. So the point being that it is self-evident in our times, we are seeing this phrase enacted in front of our eyes. Who could have ever imagined? Who could have ever imagined? Three or four, or I forgot now, five of the, they keep on changing, of the tallest 10 buildings in the world are in that region. Go figure. And who did them? Shepherds that were born barefoot, poor, and each one is competing with the other to see who is going to build the taller building. So these are all specific incidents that have been predicted by our Prophet wasallam. Let us now move on to the next section of our predictions, and that is general trends. It's not one-off. It's a general trend that the Prophet predicted things would change towards the end of times. And he's mentioning how societal changes will occur. What is going to change in culture? What is going to change in how people live and how people interact? So we'll mention around 10 or 15 of the general trends predicted by our Prophet Of them, he explicitly predicted that our problem of this ummah would be an excess of wealth, a surplus of wealth, not a lack of wealth. Generally speaking, the ummah would have plenty of wealth. Hadith is in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Every ummah is tested with one fitna. And the fitna that Allah will test my ummah with is money. The fitna that Allah will test my ummah with is money. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That one day money came from Bahrain and the Prophet was going to distribute it at Fajr time. So he prayed Fajr and he saw the masjid packed like it was Jumu'ah. And he said, it looks like you have heard that the money has arrived. They said, yes. He said, I give you glad tidings. Don't worry. You will get your money. But wallahi, I am not worried that you will be poor after I die. I am worried that this world will open its treasures to you. And you will compete with one another to see who has the most treasure. And in that competing, you will destroy yourselves like the nations before you destroyed themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ, when there was extreme poverty, when many Sahaba did not even have two pieces of cloth. When in the Madani phase, he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Aisha says, never ate to his full twice. When six weeks would go by, and they didn't light a fire because they didn't have meat to cook. Six weeks would go by without a fire. In that phase, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted, my ummah will be a rich ummah. And we have wealth. Even the lands that are deemed to be poor, their natural resources are of the most wealthy. Even for example, Afghanistan that has a low GDP, the natural resources in terms of minerals, in terms of what it has, the world is salivating over it because of what it has. So the Muslim ummah is blessed with wealth. Mismanagement and greed is what has destroyed it. But we are a wealthy nation overall. And alhamdulillah, by and large, in many countries, the Muslims are living good lives, including the ones here in the Western lands as well. So our Prophet then predicted this. He also predicted that evils would spread. And this is many, many things. For example, he predicted that people will stop trusting one another. The loss of amana, trust. He said, when people stop trusting one another, 
wait for judgment day, it's around the corner. When amana is lost, when people stop trusting one another, he also predicted the rise of corrupt and evil rulers. When people who are not worthy become leaders, he said, wait for judgment day. The worst become the leaders, wait for judgment day. He also predicted that there would be plenty of bloodshed and fighting. He predicted that the ummah would fight at a time when no two Muslims had ever drawn swords against one another. Imagine that. Never in the seerah did two Muslims draw blood as a civil war in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Never did the two Muslim camps, in one occasion they, they came close to a fist fight, but it never went beyond that, never went beyond that. And even that fist fight, if you read the seerah, the munafiqun were the ones that were instigating it and not even there. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that the ummah would continually fight amongst itself until judgment day. Once the sword is unsheathed, he said, it will never be put back in and the ummah will constantly fight until judgment day. He also predicted that not only the ummah, but overall killing and bloodshed and wars would be increased. And he predicted that people would kill one another for no reason whatsoever. And this was unknown. You know, mass shootings that are common in this land. We grow up and we are accustomed to them. Every few days we wake up and some crazed lunatic has killed people for absolutely no reason. We are accustomed to it. We need to understand this phenomenon does not take place anywhere in the world other than this land. You all know this. Anywhere in the world, this really does not take place. Number one. Number two, even this is a recent phenomenon. It is unknown in human history that people just go on a mass killing for no reason and kill people. And our Prophet ﷺ said, the judgment day will not come until the killer and the one killed will not know why each one did it to the other. Neither will the killer have a motive, nor the one killed will know why was I killed? What was the purpose of my killing? Senseless killing. And this was predicted by our Prophet ﷺ and hadith is in Bukhari. Of the predictions as well, and this is something that, again, we are born at a time and place, we never think twice about it. Our Prophet ﷺ predicted that intercourse outside of marriage would become the norm. Zina would become the norm. Now, again, we are born in a time and a place where it is the norm. So we kind of think that has been the case always. No. Even in Jahiliyyah, even in pre-Islam, families with dignity, with respect, did not engage in premarital, much less extramarital. And that is why in the famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari, it's also in, in, in uh, Sirah ibn Hisham, when the conquest of Mecca took place, and grudgingly, Abu Sufyan and his wife accepted Islam. And what is the name of the wife of Abu Sufyan? Who can tell me? Hind, Hind, all of us Hindi should know what it is, right? By the way, why was Hind called Hind? Another tangent here. And this is going to help us Hindi people. Why was Hind called Hind? <laughs> Abu Sufyan's wife was from India, mashallah, mashallah. No, 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 all the Sayyids are from India. Just remember that, okay? All the Sayyids, we are from India, mashallah, tabarakallah. I predict, I, I say all of the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, they migrated to India and Pakistan. That's why every second one of us, mashallah, we are Sayyids. Anyway, that's just a joke. Why was Hind called Hind? Mashallah, is good for us people from that part of the world. The Arabs exoticized India. And so something that was very beautiful was Hindi. So Hind was called Hind, meaning it's a name that is meant to imply. Her father would have named her this. Utba would have named her this to imply she will be a beautiful lady from India, an Indian type of lady. So they're called Hind. Anyway, where was I? So when Hind embraced Islam, she wasn't too happy, but she did it. Then Allah opened her heart for, for Islam. So she came to uh, give the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a famous story. It's actually a very funny story if you listen to her, the many things happened there. So much so Umar bin Khattab fell down laughing so loud, he couldn't contain his laughter. It was a funny thing. I'm not gonna we don't have time to that. One of the phrases, Hind objected to every condition somehow. Yet she still took the oath of allegiance, right? So the conditions are going forth, and Hind has something sarcastic to prod back. 
And one of the conditions was that once you embrace Islam, you will not do zina, you know, outside of marriage. You will not in have intercourse outside of marriage. This phrase, Hind was not sarcastic, she was shocked. She was not coming with a swift comeback. On the contrary, she was shocked. What type of condition is this? And she said, ya Rasulullah? Does any free lady of dignity commit zina that you have to put this condition on us? In other words, even though she is not a Muslim at the time, she's lived her life in pre-Islam, the concept of intercourse outside of marriage, she was like, what? Why would you put this condition on us? What, 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 is it even possible that a dignified lady will do this? Right? This was the perception they had pre-Islam. And again, I'd like to remind us in this land, you will be shocked to find out that all of these trends go back one generation. Back in the 30s and 40s, the people are still alive of this land. In their age, if somebody wanted to marry another you know, person, they would have to ask permission from the father of the lady to go out on a date. And the date would be chaperoned. And the goal would be not just flirting around. No, this is now of marriageable age. The man has a job. He's 25, 26 years old. The lady's 22, 23. The goal is, are we compatible? This is back in the 40s and 50s. It was impossible in that era. And that's why if a lady became pregnant one generation ago, it was a matter of shame for that, for that family. They would send the girl to some type of private boarding school. This is literally one generation ago. Things have changed completely from the 60s and second wave feminism and you know, the radical movements you know, from you know, the, 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 the free you know, sexual liberation movements and whatnot. All of this changed in the late 60s, early 70s. All of this before for this point in time, even this land and all of the Western world, they had remnants of haya, they had remnants of dignity and decency. One generation and everything has changed so much so that these days, if a young kid in high school is not dating, the council will have a conversation. What's wrong with you? Everything okay? Everything okay? Everything, why aren't you doing something, right? And statistics, wallahi, are depressing over 70 and i'm sorry to be blunt but you know you're going to hear this from me listen hiding these statistics is not going to change reality perhaps some of you might be shocked oh my god he's speaking like this in the masjid yeah if i don't speak about it in the masjid where else are you going to hear it if you're not going to understand i'm not i'm not going to understand that our children are living in this land and they're facing these problems and we don't solve them here where else do you expect them to be solved so I apologize from now I'm still you, you know you don't know my habits that well but I don't shy away from speaking that which is going to protect our community over 75% of teenagers in this land are engaging in intercourse teenagers 75% both genders stop deluding yourself that your children and your child is an angel. Stop deluding yourself. My child and your children are living in the same land. May Allah protect all of us. We need to be aware of this. I'm sorry to be so blunt. A colleague of mine did her PhD in a Canadian university in sociology. I know her. I read her summary of the PhD. I have it on, on my file. And the PhD was the drug and sexual habits of Muslims on college campuses. The most thorough survey done of our Muslim community. And I'm not going to give you the numbers because honestly, I thought I knew. But reading that, it was like a dagger to my heart. We have an endemic crisis. I'm not going to give you the numbers. Suffice to say, it is terrifying. Terrifying. She did an anonymous survey, the most thorough survey of college going Muslim boys and Muslim girls. Drug use, tobacco use, uh, alcohol, um, uh, and zina. And the surveys are there. It's a public PhD. You can even find it if you want to look at it. It's there. The findings are there. This is the world we live in. Now my point is, this could never have been predicted even a hundred years ago. Even a hundred years ago. No one could have predicted this type of revolution because these families, the same people that were living amongst, they had haya as well. I mean, if you watch Lil House on the Prairie, they're wearing hijab better than some of us wear hijab. 
That's the reality. They had strict laws. Men and women are not going to be together you know, in public. They're not going to go out on a date unless it is meant for marriage purposes. There's no such thing as casual dating. All of this has changed. And our Prophet ﷺ predicted what? He predicted in Tisharu Zina. Zina would be everywhere. And he also predicted that nudity would be everywhere. Fahisha would be everywhere. That people would show their bodies in public. And again, I don't need to comment to you. I just want to mention once again, these are things we don't understand and know. But in this country, in our own generation, the issues of pornography have changed radically. In the 60s even, it was technically illegal to get pornography. In the 60s. And the famous you know, Hustler magazine guy went to the Supreme Court and overturned the ruling. And in one generation, from it being illegal to get a magazine, now pornography is ruining every household in this land. And we still are reeling from the damages because of the internet and what not. Who could have predicted this? Who could have predicted this? One generation ago, the government, our government, had a special body to monitor Hollywood. And any scene that was deemed to be immoral was cut off. This is Hollywood. And that is why you will not find nudity in black and white movies. Why? Because our own government had some haya. And they would monitor Hollywood movies, subhanAllah, in the 30s and 40s, if it showed drug use or extramarital affairs, the movie would have to show that the people who did it suffered because they wanted to teach morality. They wanted to demonstrate that drug users don't end up happy. They wanted to demonstrate extramarital affairs, they have problems. This is in this land. That's why if you look at the 40s and 50s, Clark Gable, all of these famous people, you look at their movies, overall there's a positive image. Not that negative. Nowadays, A'udhu Billah, even Disney Channel, you have to say, Astaghfirullah, Toba Toba, when you watch Disney Channel, right? When I grew up, Disney Channel was relatively innocent, back in the 80s and whatnot. Relatively innocent, okay? We grew up in a different era. Now, Disney Channel itself, every second joke is a sexual innuendo. Every second thing is about boyfriend, girlfriend, and then these days, boyfriend, boyfriend as well. Who could have predicted this in one generation? Our Nabi ﷺ predicted it. He predicted it in an era and a time place where no one could have imagined that nudity would be prevalent. And he said that this is going to be the norm. So much so, and the, the, the hadith is explicit, he's, and this hadith is authentic, that a time will come when copulation will occur in public like donkeys do. In public. And well, I think we are even less than one generation of Allah Musta'an. The way things are headed now, Allah protect us. And there will be a man who will see this happening and he will say to them, couldn't you get a room? Couldn't you go behind a, 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 a door or a wall? And that man, the Prophet said, will be deemed by them to be so righteous the way you look at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Look at this. And if you look at where this society is heading, I swear to you, it is terrifying. Anyone above the age of 35, you see how quickly, you teenagers, you youngsters, for you this seems to be the norm. We who have grown up in the 70s and 80s, we will tell you how quickly things have changed in our own lifetimes. From where to where. And what's going to happen in one generation? It's exponentially changing. It's not changing, you know, steadily. No, it's exponentially changing. And frankly, that also explains the rise of weird manifestations of uh, sexual habits as well, which we're seeing as well, because this is what happens when you open the door. Who predicted this? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentioned that towards the end of times, there will be a lot of women who, they are clothed and yet they are naked. Kasiyatun Ariyat. Hadith is in Bukhari. In other words, they're not dressed properly. And Ma'ilatun Mumilat. They will love to entice others. And others will love to be enticed by them. In other words, what this means? Flirtation is open. And sexuality is open. Our elders here don't know what Tinder is. This is what Tinder is. This is exactly what it is. They want to do one way and the other one wants to do back to them. This is now open without even haya. Haya itself has gone. And this is explicitly predicted by the Prophet ﷺ, That of the last things to be gone from Mankind will be haya. When haya is gone, wait for judgment day. And we see this as well. Of the things predicted as well, is the proliferation of intoxications towards the end of times. 
and the proliferation of music as well. Now, music existed in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It existed, but it wasn't common. It wasn't the norm. Uh, intoxicants existed, of course, but again, it wasn't the norm. And our Prophet ﷺ came and forbade intoxication and definitely discouraged the issue of musical instruments. And he predicted that a time will come when this will be the norm. It will be everywhere. And again, we see this now that the rise of, you know, marijuana and other things is now the norm, common. It is something that unfortunately even our own youngsters, many of them don't think this to be a big deal as well. Of the uh, trends that are predicted by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the building of magnificent masjids that will be empty. We seek Allah's refuge from ever having magnificent masjids that are empty. It's good to have good masjids but we want them to be packed. But he, meant, he mentioned, he predicted that a time will come when the masjid will be magnificent and nobody will come to pray in them. We seek Allah's refuge, but there are plenty of masajid. Millions, multi-millions. And I don't want to mention too explicit, but especially in those old rich countries, you see in the middle of nowhere, just for the sake of showing that I built it. And so much, hundreds of millions is spent. And when you come to salah, it is... Empty, completely empty. That's not the goal of the Sharia. Now, again, you're coming to the masjid, we want the masjid to be beautiful, alhamdulillah. The problem is not in beautifying the masjid, the problem is in building the masjid for the sake of the building and not for the sake of the people. When the masjid is empty, that is a problem. And our process and predicted that there will come a time when Zakhrafat al Masajid, the masjid will be beautiful, but the people will not be there to pray. And that is the exact opposite of the masjid of the Prophet. ﷺ. The masjid was very, very simple. So much so, perhaps if one of us went there, we would wrinkle our nose and we'd have to put our hands and clothes like this, like there was no carpet. There was no carpet. The masjid had pebbles. And that's why the Sahaba would not take their shoes off when they entered. They would pray with their shoes in that masjid, by the way. Because you were praying on the sand, on the rubble. You're praying on the pebbles. There is no carpet. So the Sahaba would pray with their shoes on. And there was no roof. And one time it rained. Everybody became soaking wet. And so some leaves were put for a temporary period of time. In the whole lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, there was not a solid roof. Do you know that? In the whole lifetime, this happened in the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He decided to make some solid thatched roof. Otherwise, in the whole lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no solid roof. Eventually, they put a interlocking leaves to protect them from the sun, but not from the rain. And that is why even one of the final Ramadans of our Prophet's life, it rained heavily and the masjid became muddy. And Anas said, Malik said, For wallahi, I swear, I saw the Prophet ﷺ lower his head into the mud in the 27th or 23rd night. It was predicted to be Laylatul Qadr. And he raised his head up and the mud was on his forehead. He was not embarrassed or shy to put his head down for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one is honored more than the one who lowers his head to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being, the Prophet ﷺ predicted this issue of beautifying the masajid while neglecting the people in the uh, masjid and Anas ibn Malik commented on this hadith the hadith of the masjid and he said a time will come when people will boast about the masjid but they won't visit it they will boast about how beautiful the masjid is but they will not be inside praying we seek Allah's refuge and inshallah our masjid is not like that but let us be honest there are masjid around the globe that People do boast about their masjid, but the boast that how big it is, how beautiful it is, and not the quality of the people uh, in it. Of the generic trends that are mentioned, and this is one of those trends that again, very cryptic, the famous hadith in uh, uh, the hadith of Jibreel. The hadith of Jibreel, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that of the signs of judgment day is that the slave girl shall give birth to her own master. This is one of the most famous cryptic predictions of Judgment Day. What does it mean that a slave girl will give birth to her own master? This is one of those things, again, like I said, there are a lot of different opinions about what this implies. One opinion is that Islam will spread so quickly that people will lose track of who is a slave and who belongs to whom, such that the children 
will then assume that their own mother is their slave. And this is therefore, what is the prediction? The prediction is the quick conquest of Islam. The prediction is how quickly Islam will spread. That is one interpretation. Another interpretation, which is the one of Hafid ibn Hajar, is that children will become dominant over their parents. I'll be quiet here and let that sink in amongst the parents, especially those parents who have teenagers, and take some consolation that this is predicted and Ibn Hajar has predicted it. Children will become bossy and domineering over the parents. Who is in charge? If you go to some households, you don't quite know who is actually in charge of what is going on. And in fact, this was commented on by Ibn Hajar 800 years ago, that the meaning of this hadith is that the children will dominate and give the orders and be disrespectful to their parents. So they will be the ones calling the shots and the parents will be then, you know, uh, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, being in charge. So this is another interpretation as well, that the children will be disrespectful and the children will be bossy uh, over their parents. These are the two main interpretations of this hadith. Number one, we said, that Islam will spread very quickly, so we won't know who is who. And number two, that children will dominate over their parents. And Allah knows best what is the actual uh, meaning of this. Of the uh, predictions that are the general trends that are predicted of the Prophet wasallam, is the increase in the number of markets, bazaars, the increase of shopping centers. Now, were there not shopping centers in classical times? Of course there were. But typically, typically, every city had one area. Medina had one area. Mecca had one area. It was the bazaar. And it was very rare for a mid-sized city to have two bazaars. It just didn't make sense. There's the place, you go and shop and sell, you come back. So to have multiple shopping centers, and shopping centers and bazaars and souks, generally speaking, our sharia has mentioned that they are not the most beloved of places. Why? Because number one, materialism and dunya. Number two, cheating and lying. Number three, interest. Number four, robberies will take place over there. Number five, from the beginning of times, shopping malls have been associated with the riffraff and the thugs and the ruffians and the flirtations. That happens over there to this day. Back then, this is the way it is, right? You want to do something or you want to, you go there and you go. It's not a place of piety and taqwa. And that's why our Prophet ﷺ said, the most beloved of all places of any city are its masajid. And the most despised of any city are its shopping places. Shopping place, you need to go, you go and you cut out. You do what you need to do, you leave. But to make that your socialization, this leads to a hardening of the heart. This leads to love of the dunya. This leads to whatever you have, I want the next level up. It's not healthy. What's the point of this? And our Prophet ﷺ predicted shopping centers would proliferate. And again, we see this in our times as well. Of the most amazing things that he predicted, and again, this is truly amazing. Very amazing thing. Of the amazing things he predicted. Hadith is in <coughs> Sahih Bukhari. That of the signs of Judgment Day, obesity will spread amongst the people. This is exactly from Sahih Bukhari. وَيَظْهَرُ فِيهِمُ السَّمِنِ And semen is, what is semen, ya Arabs? What is semen? Butter. Fat. That is semen. وَيَظْهَرُ فِيهِمُ السَّمِنِ This hadith is in Bukhari. Of the signs of judgment day. Now, it is awkward because I'm also trying to lose weight. Don't worry, we're all in the same boat here. Okay. But, wallahi, jokes aside, what an amazing prediction. We need to go back even 200 years, a thousand years, a thousand five hundred years. Nobody was fat. Anybody who was obese is the exception, not the rule. The Romans, the Persians, the Indians, the Chinese, the Arabs, everybody's busy walking, doing things. Obesity was never a problem of a land. It didn't happen. You always had the one, you know, very spoiled, rich, whatever. You always have that one person. But as a trend, 
it did not exist in any land. Think about that. And for our Prophet wasallam to say that obesity will be a global trend, this is mind-boggling. No one could have imagined that there's going to be a World Health Council about the problem of obesity in the modern world. No one could imagine that the United Nations would have a department monitoring the obesity of countries. No one could have imagined this even 50 years ago, much less 1,500 years ago. But that is exactly what our Prophet ﷺ predicted, that obesity will be rampant in my ummah and in all ummahs. And that is the reality. Now, again, it's an awkward thing and I do again apologize, but what does this mean? Is obesity haram? Is it, is it sinful to be overweight? Why is the Prophet ﷺ saying this? Well, let us be very clear. Obesity is definitely not something that our sharia encourages. Let's be honest about this. And again, I speak as somebody who myself, I am an inch or two I need to lose. And I'm also in the same boat as, as all of you. That's why the boat is so heavy, mashallah, tabarakallah. We have to be clear. Do you think that it is something that our Lord and our Prophet encourage? Because what, what does obesity indicate? Tell me. Hmm? Laziness, what else? Gluttony, what else? Hmm? Spoiled. So when you're spoiled, you're giving up something else, which is health, being physically fit, being physically active. If you need to defend yourself, your family, your deen, how should you be? Obese or fit? A society that is obese, how can it defend itself when? People are knocking its doors down. So let's be brutally honest. It is not haram. You're not going to go to Jahannam if you're three pounds of weight. Alhamdulillah, don't worry about that. But let's be honest here. It's not something that Allah and His Messenger encourage. And that is why our Prophet said that of the signs of Judgment Day is that obesity will be rampant. Everyone will be struggling with this. And A'udhu Billah, but out of the top 10 countries, I think seven are Muslim nations. The number one country in the world is a Muslim country. Number two is a Muslim country. I think number four is a Muslim country. We are all struggling with this. In some countries, the majority of people and citizens, Muslim lands, are classified as obese. And again, go back one generation no one could have thought of this. One generation, the same oil-rich lands that are now, mashallah, Ruz Bukhari and Dajjaj and Qabs and all this, right? That one generation ago, they were struggling to get food. They were struggling for bread. Again, just because we're born in a time place, we don't ever think back. This same society, their fathers and grandfathers were struggling for food. And the tables have turned. And now, so much food they have that they're struggling what to do with it. And this is predicted by our Prophet ﷺ. Of the predictions that our Prophet ﷺ predicted as well is the increase of natural calamities and especially of earthquakes. Kathratu zalazil. Earthquakes would be on the rise. And I, I read a survey somewhere that somebody statistically compiled all the earthquakes of the last 500 years. And they did mention, this was a non-Muslim, there's an academic paper, uh, they did mention that over the last 100 years or so, the frequency of earthquakes has actually increased. So this is now basically a fact that in the last century or so, the frequency of earthquakes. So look at California, and may Allah protect the Muslims and everybody over there. So the frequency of earthquakes is definitely on the um, rise. Of the uh, signs of Judgment Day as well, of the signs of Judgment Day, which is something that we are seeing now, is the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and that hadith is in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the Day of Judgment will only arise or happen when a room are the dominant civilization of the world. This hadith is a Sahih Muslim. Who are the Rum? I mentioned the sister asked this question last week. And I said, the Prophet used the word a Rum. And a Rum literally means the Romans. And the Romans were a civilization 
who by and large no longer exist as that race. But Western civilization by and large considers itself to be, if not the biological, definitely the intellectual heirs of the Roman tradition. They pride themselves on ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And that is why every one of us that has gone through their high schools and universities, when we start studying history, we start with their history, not with human history. When we study the classics, who do we study? The Iliad and Homer's Odyssey, and we go back to Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, and we go and start from there. Then we work our way through the Renaissance and then Newton, and then, then we go through the Judeo Christian side of things. And so this society is essentially standing on two pillars, and those pillars are Judeo Christian heritage and Greco Roman Hellenistic heritage. The melding of those two is what has produced Western civilization. And therefore, it is not at all a stretch. To say when the Prophet said a room, he's talking about the modern West. This is to me no brainer. And what did he predict? That a room will be the dominant civilization of the world. And once again, when he said this, Europe was nothing. Europe was backward. They were called barbarians. The Arabs considered the Germans and others to be barbar barbarians. The word Barbar means they couldn't understand Barbar, like Barbar, bar, bar, like this, that's why they call them the Barbar tribes and the barbarian term are from the same root, right? You just don't understand them, like they're just, you know, speaking like that. So the Europeans of that time, 7-800, why didn't Tariq ibn Ziyad go up north? One of the theories is he shrugged his shoulders and said, what am I going to do up there? There's nobody there of, of worth to conquer. Why should I go to Paris and to go on to, there is nothing there, you know? London, in the time of the process, barely had 3,000 people. What is that to conquer? You have to look at Constantinople, right? Europe was rising. As for North America, there was nothing there, Aslan, you know? So, what happened? A room began to be more and more and more popular. And with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, this allowed the Latin Empire which is a room to start coming on the rise, right? Because before 1453, Europe was always in the shadow of the actual Byzantine Empire, which is Constantinople, right? And it was only after that, that finally they can say, okay, we are the dominant civilization. And then of course, slowly, Europe continued its ascent until Ottoman lands and European lands were fighting one another almost like equals, 15th century, 16th century, they're almost like equals. Then 17th century, and then the decline begins, late 1700s, early 1800s, until Ottoman lands become the sick man of Europe, and then the Muslims take a nose fall, die fall, technologically, never theologically, and never morally. Never, ever, ever short sell yourselves Muslims. We are the dominant when it comes to akhlaq. We are the dominant, alhamdulillah, when it comes to aqidah. We are the dominant when it comes to belief in Allah and His Messenger. But GDP and technologically, Allah Azza wa Jal tests people and up and down and that's besides the point for the Akhirah. Once upon a time, Muslims were the dominant technologically. But things changed. And 1700 onwards in particular, the Ottomans began to go down and down. Europe came on the rise and now we see the tables have turned. What did the Prophet say? And this is the first time that the global civilization is Western. 250 years ago, nobody could have predicted would it be the Ottomans or the Europeans. We were both head on head. Literally, I'm not exaggerating, go back. 250 years ago, no one could have predicted which civilization would be the dominant. We were both on par with one another. But then that changed and one civilization rose. And this leads us to the terrifying notion that this might be one of the precursors because for the first time since the original Roman Empire, the heirs of the Roman empires have now risen up from the ashes and they are the dominant civilization of the world as predicted by our Prophet ﷺ. Of the predictions of the Prophet ﷺ as well, of the trends that are given. And again, this is very interesting. See, here's what I want you to think about. Just a hypothetical scenario. A'udhu billah, hypothetical. Imagine a, 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 a false prophet, a charlatan, in the middle you know, of nowhere, 1,500 years ago. And imagine if he had to make predictions. What I'm trying to say, 
It's impossible that what we are reading would have been predicted by a false prophet. The very notions that are coming indicate that the one who said this, Allah is communicating with him. That's what I'm trying to say. No one could have imagined what the Prophet ﷺ predicted is going to happen and we are seeing it over here. And of the things he predicted is kitaba, writing would become prevalent. Writing would become prevalent. Literacy rates. Once again, who could have predicted? When the Quran was revealed in Mecca, the city of Mecca probably had around 2,000, 1,500 people, 2,000 people in it. Of those 1,500, 2,000, probably less than a dozen could read and write. That's like what? 1%. 1%. And our Prophet ﷺ predicted, إِنَّ مِنْ عَلَامَاتِ السَّاعَةِ Of the signs of judgment day is kitaba will be prevalent. Remember, most of the Sahaba could not read and write because that was the society. That's nobody taught them. That's the way they were. To predict that reading and writing will become the norm, not just in Muslim lands, but in the globe, is once again beyond even understanding. And this is exactly what he predicted. Now, another prediction seems to contradict this one. And that's the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. The hadith of Kitaba is in Muslim Imam Ahmed. Sahih Bukhari mentions another prediction. That, that one of the signs of the end of times is that ignorance will prevail. Jahl will be everywhere. Ignorance will prevail. Now, how can ignorance prevail? And at the same time, the Prophet is saying reading and writing will prevail. Is this not a contradiction? And the response is, each hadith is valid but it applies to different things. When the Prophet ﷺ is saying, ignorance will prevail, he's not talking about reading and writing. He's talking about knowledge of right and wrong. He's talking about common sense. And when he's talking about kitaba, he's talking about literacy. Before the rise of the internet, those of you who witnessed that era, in the 80s and 90s, Mankind foolishly believed that if only we could give people access to education, they will all become intellectuals. The internet came and all of Encyclopedia Britannica times 100 became free of charge. Wikipedia and this and that. Any database you want is there, any journal you're there. And mankind has not gone more intelligent. It has even taken a nosedive beyond that. This is what our Prophet is saying. Kitaba will increase. Jahala will also increase. It's not a contradiction. Because not necessarily just because you're reading, your intelligence will increase. So there is no contradiction in that. There are many other trends that are predicted as well. I want to come to a conclusion. There's only five minutes left. Then I'll give you time for Q&A, inshallah. Come to a conclusion. And by the way, this isn't an exhaustive list. Realize, of course, that uh, you know, for our classes, obviously, there have to be some condensation of the material. Many other things are predicted as well. And there are many, there's another entire section of a hadith that are not authentic. What I mentioned to you in today's lecture, every hadith is authentic, inshallah ta'ala. I didn't even get to the da'if hadith uh, in this regard. But just want to mention off with the final of the minor signs, and we mentioned him on Saturday, but just to reiterate, that our Prophet ﷺ predicted the coming of one man. And his name will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he will be called by the people, the rightly guided, which is the Mahdi. And he predicted in over 30 hadith, I mentioned around 15 of them on Sunday, uh, sorry, on Saturday we did, yeah? And I mentioned over 15 of them, and the concept is definitely authentic. He predicted the coming of this man. And our scholars mentioned this man is the final of the minor signs of Judgment Day. And that is the Mahdi. And the Mahdi will be a link or a bridge between the minor signs and the beginning of the major signs. Between the minor signs and the beginning of the major signs. And the beginning of the major signs will be the coming of Dajjal. That is the first of the ten major signs. And that's going to be our lectures inshallah. And our next lesson will continue after, after coming back from Hajj. The first of the major signs is Dajjal. The Mahdi will be alive when Dajjal 
comes. So the last of the minor signs, the first of the major signs will coincide with one another and the Mahdi will see the coming of Dajjal. He will fight Dajjal but will not be successful. Then the second of the major signs will come and that is Isa ibn Maryam. And the Mahdi will be alive at that time and the Mahdi will fight in the army of Isa and then eventually Isa will be the one who kills Ad-Dajjal and then there is no mention of the uh, Mahdi. By the way, there's another interesting sign mentioned and Allah knows best what it implies but the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And it is that uh, judgment will not come until 12 Khulafa from the Quraysh will lead the Ummah. 12 Khalifas, Kulluhum in Quraysh, they will lead. They will lead this Ummah. And uh, scholars have differed who these 12 are. Ibn Taymiyyah has uh, an ishtihad, and that's the first four, and then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and then his four. So he wants to put them in the Umayyad time frame. He wants to make all of them in the Umayyad time frame. And then um, uh, it is from this hadith that the non Sunni denomination. You understand what I'm saying here? The non-Sunni, I don't like to mention terms explicitly, but the largest denomination of the non-Sunni denomination, okay? Because you have the Fivers, you have the Seveners, you have the Twelvers. So the Twelvers, where did one of the evidences they get it from? They got it from this hadith, which is actually in Sahih Bukhari, okay? And of course, the hadith has nothing to do with their theology, but they took it and they then made the number 12 from it. Our tradition doesn't say that these 12 are going to be superhumans flying in the air, walking on water. No, it's just going to be 12 righteous leaders. Kulluhum min Quraysh. All of them will be from the uh, Quraysh. And so there's going to be 12 powerful Khulafa. Overall, they were good Khulafa. And uh, as I said, Ibn Taymiyyah wants to mention, you know, uh, six of the Umawids and four of the... Um, uh, four of the, uh, the, the Khulafa Rashidun and others and he adds them on so Allah knows best we don't know but a hadith mentions there will be 12 uh, Qurashis that will be there and with this inshallah ta'ala we will pause for two weeks uh, I'm going for Hajj inshallah in two days I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts the Hajj of all of us going for Hajj and allows us to turn safety to our families and friends and then inshallah we will resume this uh, class Wednesday class after uh, two weeks of absence, we'll come back and then continue from the first of the major signs, which is at dajjal And then we will discuss the controversies over Dajjal. Is he alive right now? Is he locked up in some cave somewhere in, in, in the Bahamas or whatever? Not the Bahamas, it doesn't make sense. Some Caribbean island. No, what's that? Not the Bahamas. What am I thinking of? Bermuda Triangle. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, the Bermuda Triangle. Is he locked up over there somewhere? All of these controversies, inshallah, we will discuss uh, when the class resumes after that. So we open the floor now for Q&A, insha'Allah ta'ala. Sisters, get your questions ready because as of yet, I haven't heard much questions from the sisters. Keep them relevant to the class. Bismillah, go ahead. So let me rephrase the question. When we are preaching and teaching Islam, these ambiguous hadith come up, cryptic predictions of Judgment Day. What is the best way to uh, teach or approach these subjects? Look, where the wording is cryptic, we should always narrate the wording and then say, Allah knows best, this seems to be an interpretation. We should never categorically say, this is what the Prophet intended. How do we know? I'll give you an example. This, had, this lecture was not exhaustive. One of the predictions of our Prophet ﷺ is that uh, you will fight a group of people, uh, their eyes will be squinty. Hadith says that and their uh, faces will be flat like a shield, okay? And scholars have interpreted that to mean Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. Maybe that's true. Maybe that is true. But I'll give you another example. The Quran mentions the coming of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَدْ يَأْجُوجُ مَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ When Genghis Khan came, and he massacred blood everywhere outside the city of Urgench, which I visited a few weeks ago. I was in Urgench a few weeks ago. He made a pyramid of a million Muslim skulls. One million. He massacred the whole city and he made a pyramid of the heads of the women and children and men over there. The Muslims witnessing the conquest of Genghis Khan, of Genghis Khan, 
they swore by Allah this has to be Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And Qiyamah is gonna come right now. We're just waiting for Isa to come and Dajjal to come because Chengiz Khan is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And all of the ahadith about Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they applied it to Chengiz Khan. And perhaps if we were alive back then, we too would have been certain we are seeing Ya'juj and Ma'juj. What else are you gonna think? You're going to be coming from everywhere and doing all of this. They look like Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The descriptions are there. But it turns out they weren't Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So from this we learn, never ever ever take a cryptic hadith and then be certain. Go ahead and say, perhaps. So I just said today that the Prophet predicted barefoot shepherds competing with one another. Now, in our times, we see this happening. What if a generation later, an even more explicit example happens? Because right now, the people competing, their fathers were barefoot shepherds. The actual three or four princes were born in the lap of luxury. So, it's nothing wrong to apply this hadith here. And that's why I said it looks like it's happening. But how do we know? Maybe next generation, Literally something will happen and you will have barefoot shepherds doing this. Then that generation will say, aha, look, this hadith is now applicable. So go ahead and give an ijtihad if the scholars have done it. You can quote Ibn Hajj, you can quote, go ahead. But always say Allah knows best and leave cryptic hadith as they are and Allah knows what the future will hold, inshaAllah. Okay, sisters, a question. Yes, go ahead, sisters, go ahead. Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the timeline we will do inshallah in a few weeks. They are after the Dajjal and they are before the trumpet is blown when Isa and his followers are still around. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come at a time frame when the Dajjal has been killed. There shall be peace in the world. Remember I said last uh, Tuesday or last Wednesday that the sine wave is going to go higher and lower and higher and lower. It's going to be the best of times. I'm quoting Charles Dickens here. It's the best of times. The worst of times are going to go up and down. So at that time frame, Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come after one of the highs where Isa is in charge. The world is at peace. Then will be one of the lowest of lows. And that is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then there will be yet another high. And then the believers will be taken away. So we'll mention this story inshallah in four to five weeks because we're going to do the Jan and others. Yeah, Juj Ma'juj will come towards even after that. Back to the brothers. Bismillah, yes, go ahead. This is Yeah, Juj Ma'juj. We will mention Dhul Qarnayn. But Dhul Qarnayn is not one of the signs of Judgment Day. Our brother wants to put Dhul Qarnayn with the Eskimos. And Allah knows best where Dhul Qarnayn went. We do not know. Allah knows best. And the Hadith do not match. And I'll talk about Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn is a past figure who plays a role for Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Something happened in the past that will play a role for Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We'll talk about that inshallah in a few weeks. Back to the sisters. Yes, go ahead. So our sister asks, what is the narrative of Christians in their belief of Jesus coming? First, they realize one segment of Christians, typically Baptists and certain strands of evangelicals. These are the ones that are embracing the second coming of Jesus. And that is why... Uh, you will find a group called Christian Zionists. There are Christians who are the most ardent supporters of Zionism because they believe that when the children of Israel are all gathered in the Holy Land, that is a necessary precursor for the coming of Jesus Christ. And that is why some of the most ardent Zionists of this country are not Jewish people. They are people of a Christian background. Our current guy in the office, he is flirting with Christian Zionists because he wants their support. He wants to get them to support him because of his policy. So their version of events is that, and again, there are multiple interpretations. Their version of events is that when Jesus will come, those who truly believed in him will magically disappear and be transported to heaven with him. Okay, And the wretched will be left on earth. So they have this notion of Jesus coming back, gathering his followers, and with his followers magically being transported to heaven. So they're just going to disappear and go into heaven. So there's a series, a very prominent series left behind. Okay, it's one of the most 
popular readings amongst the evangelical community. The youth, the, the, the housewives, they love it. It is national bestsellers. Why? What's it about? Those that are left behind. Those that didn't make it to Jesus' cut because they weren't Christian enough. So the goal is you better be Christian enough so you're not left behind. And of course, they do believe in the Armageddon. They do believe in a massive war between good and evil. And in the end, Jesus is going to um, win. Now, by the way, this leads me to an interesting point. A lot of times, these uh, people, they say, oh, look, your hadith mentioned war and bloodshed and Armageddon. You look at this, the violence and whatnot. And the response is very clear. We say to them, this is going to be a war between Jesus and the Antichrist. If you want to choose to be on the side of the Antichrist, that's your business. But we're going to choose the side of Jesus. And this is the irony. We believe that Isa ibn Maryam will be our leader. When Isa comes back, he will be our leader, not theirs. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ not a single person of Ahl Kitab will be there except that he shall believe in Jesus before Jesus dies. Meaning, when Isa comes back, every Ahl Kitab that had even an atom's weight of Iman will become a Muslim at that time. And only those who had no Iman will choose Dajjal over Isa. And then do you blame us if the hadith happen and the bloodshed happens? Don't look at us after that, inshallah. Back to the brothers. Yes, go ahead with this. Very good question. Uh, question is about, are there a hadith about Ghazwa to Hind, Hind, conquering India? Yes, there are a number of traditions, about three to be more precise, about the notion of Muslims will conquer India and those that conquer India will be of the greatest armies, etc., etc. However, all of them are slightly weak. One of them is slightly weak, one of them is Laif Jiddan. And so that is why I did not put it in my lecture here. They do exist. And if you attended the lecture yesterday, I talked about Da'if Hadith. And we said that Da'if Hadith can be used for what guys? Who remembers? For encouraging. But they cannot be used for legal matters or theological matters. And belief in Judgment Day is theology. So we cannot be certain. But I don't have any problem quoting them if we had a longer lecture and simply pointing out that in some ahadith, ghazwat hind is predicted and the Prophet praised the army that will attack Hind. But these ahadith have a slight weakness in them. So we cannot be certain that the Prophet said them, but we hope he said them. And especially for our Muslim brothers in India, they need some help. So... We hope that inshallah those are true. Final question from the sisters, yes. Two back, okay, quickly, one after the other, quickly. So both of these wordings indicate a prophecy. The fact that something's happening in the future, the fact that day of judgment will not happen until this happens. So regardless, they're both signs of judgment day because he's prophesizing they're going to happen in the future. They're neutral. Signs are neutral. They're going to happen. Sister behind you, go ahead. So this is a very good question. Inshallah, we'll discuss it maybe in an open Q&A because this is not related directly to signs of judgment day. And by the way, I have a clip on YouTube. The sister asked, how do we explain Muslim conquests around the world? What if somebody says to us, our religion went and conquered all of these lands and there was no threat from these lands. Why did you guys conquer the world? I actually have, I think, a 15-20 minute uh, YouTube clip from my seerah. Somebody took it out in there. Um, you know, my problem is I don't know what the titles are. But... Uh, Google it, it's YouTube, it's explaining Muslim conquests. I think Muslim conquests. Yeah, Muslim conquests. Just try Muslim conquests on YouTube. Final question from the brothers. There's two minutes left. Yes, go ahead. The brother asks, the coming of Isa, is it before the Tawbah door closed or after the door of Tawbah? No, it is, af it is before. It is before. Why? Because, believe it or not, lots of people will see Isa and Dajjal and choose Dajjal over Isa. Why? Because they don't believe in the hadith in the first place. They're not going to believe in the hadith. Even when they see Dajjal, they're not going to believe in the hadith. So those who believe in the Quran and believe in the Sunnah, they will choose Isa over Dajjal. Those righteous Christians who truly believe in Isa, they will choose Isa over Dajjal. But there will be groups of Christians 
whose arrogance will be like Iblis. They see the truth and reject it. So the door of Tawbah will remain open because there will still be a test. Do you believe in Allah and His Messenger and Isa or not? And if you do, the door of Tawbah will be accepted. Only the last sign of the ten, the very last sign, which is the rising of the sun from the west. That is the last of the ten signs. That sign, there is no interpretation for it. And when that happens, the door of Tawbah will be shut. Dabba is a beast. And it is mentioned in the Bible as well. The beast that it glorifies in the name of Allah, but you cannot understand their praise. 20 years ago, thousands of American troops were racing across the deserts of Iraq toward Baghdad to invade Iraq. Experience the world's best rated Muslim streaming platform now.